This podcast is presented by the Florida Thoroughbred Breeders and Owners Association and the Florida Department of Agriculture. Yes, though it is not necessarily something those of us in the horse racing and breeding business uh, throughout the country and beyond get enough of, we have at this podcast nothing but good news to talk to you about. The recent successful and most welcome passage and signing in the law of House Bill 7063. This broad scope tax package legislation and related strategy to launch and how to best thread the legislative needle was very much brought about months earlier with a lot of ongoing discussion, collaboration with House Finance and Tax Chair, Marion County's own and our very good friend, Representative Stan McLean in particular and with our team at FTBOA, led by yours truly, and in my opinion, our 2023 session most valuable player, our longtime chief lobbyist, Tallahassee's foxhole guy you gotta have, my collaborator, and in full disclosure, if you can't tell, very close friend, Matt Bryan, of one of the most respected lobby firms in Tallahassee, Smith, Bryan, and Myers. He joins us today in studio, and Matt, we're so glad to have you. Secondly, my friend, and though you'll never say it, we all know here at FTBO that you're one of the most respected deans of the Tallahassee lobbyist community. It's an honor to have you on our team. On behalf of FTBOA and our members, and really the entire Florida thoroughbred industry throughout Marion County and the state, we thank you for your hard work, not just for this session, but all those other years before. Big time congratulations to you on your impact and your contribution to this recent legislative big win. Thank you, Matt, for all your hard work and your professionalism and the great successful win for Florida's almost $3 billion thoroughbred industry. Before we get into the executive summary of, 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 the, of the recently passed House bill and how important that legislation is, tell us a bit about what you do, what, what does a chief lobbyist for somebody like us do in your, in your overall history with the association? And if you would, a little bit about how you and I uh, uh, interact in, the, in this process uh, known as, as advocacy, if you will. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Happy to do it. I just, uh, thanks for introducing me as the Dean of the Lobby Corps. I think that just means you're old. I think, no, you, you tell me you're that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I've been a lobbyist now for 39 sessions. I always tell people I was six foot six with bangs when I started. It, <laughs> it does tend to wear you down a little bit. Uh, it's a, it's a very interesting process. I think that to, to kind of crystallize it for you, what a lobbyist does is a lobbyist helps play um, mediator and communicator between clients that want to achieve a goal through the legislative process and legislators that may or may not want to achieve that same goal. And I think the thing that makes me uh, excited about doing it every day is you have to try to figure out, uh, it's a puzzle. You have to figure out the puzzle. You have to figure out the, the way people think, what makes them tick, what makes them happy, what makes them unhappy. And, uh, and you just get in there and grind it out. It takes some creativity, but more than anything else, it just takes hard work. And uh, as far as coming to the Thoroughbred Breeders Association many, many years ago, I think I was trying to remember when it was. It had to be in like 1985 or 1986. Somewhere around that time, George Steinbrenner, who was a client of ours, called me and told me I was driving to Ocala to meet a man named Dick Hancock, and I was gonna be representing the Thoroughbred Breeders. And I said, that sounds great. Uh, how much are they going to pay me? And he said, nothing, and hung up. And that was the uh, beginning of my representation of the breeders, and I always have told the breeders every day since then that they got what they paid for that first year. <laughs> your, 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 your value has remained constant. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, and again, for those viewers out there that, that don't recall the sense of history with the FTBA, George Steinbrenner, the New York Yankees fame, a major farm owner, major uh, farm ba owner. Uh, owner of a track at one time, and was president of the FTBA for a very long time and was the one that brought you on board. For many years. And yes. I learned a lot from him. Well, fantastic. Uh, he was pretty good at picking his players. Yes, he was. And and uh, he, he did well by us. That, that worked out awfully, awfully nice. Tell me the way you, I'm going to take a stab at how people always ask, well, how do you and Matt, how do you go about your Tallahassee work? <laughs> well, you don't want to know all those details. Can't tell all those no. secrets, can we? And no, we can't tell trade, <laughs> yeah. trade secrets. But uh, you tell me how you think about this. I, in sports parlance, we both love football. Yeah. Okay. 
I look at uh, when we go to Tallahassee or when we're talking from any place and talking about uh, work to be done in Tallahassee, I look at all of it in football parlance as if the FTBOA members are the ownership of the team, the officers and board are the general manager, but I'm the coach. I'm a coach that gets forced to play defense a lot, yes, called sir. defensive plays, <laughs> yes. but I love offense. <laughs> yeah. You're the quarterback, and not only are you a quarterback, you're a quarterback that has a lot of authority and ability to audible and to be flexible. And also, we run the option. Yeah. Because we run three different plays Always. at once. Always. And that's how I see our relationship. And if you want to throw General Counsel Warren Husband in there, he's the one that's drawing up the plays that we're thinking of, and we're playing off of those sheets. For sure. For sure. So uh, anyway, I hope everybody else found that interesting. For you and I being football <laughs> folks, that, that's, how, that's how I would look at the relationship. Okay, let's get right after the, the good news. How's that? Let's do it. Uh, it's always good to talk about good news. So, but why don't we do it differently? Rather than okay. go from the beginning to the end, let's advance to the conclusion and talk about what happened and what that legislation is set to do. And then we'll work our way back to the beginning on how it all started. For sure, for sure. Okay. I, couldn't be, I couldn't be happier to be here to talk about that. Yeah. You know, as lobbyists, you We all... wouldn't have invited you here, by the way, otherwise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Might have a different look on my face if things have gone differently. But, uh, you know, as lobbyists, oftentimes you get paid to keep bad things from happening. Right. And I think sometimes it's hard to, uh, to demonstrate your value when you just consistently beat back bad ideas that could be damaging to an industry, I'm kind of, I'm very fired up to be here today because we can talk about not only the bad things that we've prevented from happening over the years, but the good things that just happened in Tallahassee. Right. And so, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to make that kind of a report to you. So to start at the end, uh, House Bill 7063 has been signed into law by Governor DeSantis. Uh, it was uh, generated by Representative McLean as the chairman of the House Finance and Tax Committee. He did a great job for us on that bill. And the bill provides uh, $55 million over the next two years for the thoroughbred industry. Uh, a lot of money for purses, a lot of money for Breer's Awards, and we can break that out if you want. Would you like to break that out? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So it's on, also, also, if you would, uh, talk about the heist of money sure, as well, which is sure. on top of that. And it's a big deal to the, the, the uh, horse owners and trainers and tracks Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. So on an annual basis, it's $5 million to the FTBOA for increasing Breeders' Awards and other incentives, which is a very large amount of money. It's never been done before at the Florida legislature in the 39 years I've been here. So that's awesome. We're very excited about that. I'm sure you'll, the folks here in Ocala will see some news about that in the very near future. Uh, there's also additional $5 million for purses at Tampa Bay Downs, and there's an additional $15 million for purses at, um, at Gulfstream Park. And, and so that's just, uh, and then there's probably a section of that bill that you'd like to talk about, which deals with the tri-party agreements between the two tracks. There's an additional uh, $3 million set aside for that uh, that particular bit. And you probably want to talk a little bit about that and then I'll wind it back up with Heisa. Uh, the Fantastic. And we're going to, we're going to devote a whole uh, show, a whole podcast on with the 24 and 25 tri-parties will tri-party agreements, the stakes agreements, if you will, for Florida breads uh, with Steve Cook from our staff. And we're going to do a deep dive on that, but just on the, on the surface level, the most important thing to know, as you said, in addition to all that, that money between the tracks and their horsemen groups of that money they have, have uh, two and a half million, a million, uh, two million from Gulfstream, half a million from Tampa will come back to FTBOA for investment into our Florida bred racing programs at their racetracks. And that's a great thing. I mean, the Gulfstream agreement in 24 will represent a 90% increase in money for Florida breads just on the racing side from, from this year. So we're very excited about that because the races for Florida breads and our Florida sire steaks and all those good things remain intact and actually have an opportunity to grow. But, you know, so much of this year earlier was all about HISA, the, 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 the new sure. federal layer of uh, regulation uh, with the great objectives of, of the safety and welfare of the horse. And, but it cost money. And when it was passed in Washington, D.C., it was almost an unfunded mandate. The, 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 the default was the tracks would pay for it. For and, sure. and then, of course, everybody knows it was going to make it downstream to the rest of the industry. 
Well, we had that as a, a major concern that was shared with the tracks and the horsemen, and it ended up getting addressed during this whole this whole legislative effort. Could you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, for sure. And you know, we had the we had the whole: is it constitutional? Is it not constitutional? I think that caused some some confusion in the legislature. They didn't know whether to put money aside for it or not. They didn't know whether it was going to be in place or not. They didn't know if there was going to be a new law in Congress, you know, superseding the previous law. And so nobody really knew what to do. But we had uh, funding for HISA in our legislative program from the get go. And we were able to get that included in the tax package, and it comes in the form of tax credits to the two tracks, so they will not have to pay out of their pocket those regulatory costs. And, of course, those regulatory costs will now not be passed on to us. We're just so thankful the legislature and the governor agreed to do this for this this industry, and I think they did it because they recognize the economic development uh, factor this this industry has the jobs uh the the clean the clean industry and uh, we always lonnie and i always tell each other all the time you know you know this lonnie you've, you've, i've said this a thousand years times to you you know we have a greater economic impact than spring training in, in florida and if you knew that you were getting a business like that what would you do to help it well the legislature stood up and and really put their foot in the ground and came through for us this time you know i i think that's a really good point i mean the message this time around i've had a lot of as you might imagine a lot of folks in the industry from different states calling up saying, hey, can I do that too? How'd you do it? And of course, we all know politics is local and it's all situational and there's a number of different ways to go ab about things. But the messaging was kind of interesting because we weren't, the message from the thoroughbred industry wasn't, hey, do something for us or we're all going away. Um, uh, this is an emergency situation. Um, we're uh, a signature industry that's still one of the tops in North America that's in a very competitive gaming market, mm -hmm. extremely competitive. And those other entities have grown, at least during the almost 12 years I've been here, and you, you've seen that happen. And it was more of a recognition of the economic impact of the business. It was a very pleasant conversation because it wasn't about handouts, it wasn't about subs, it was recognition when the state had a pool of money to put back into the economy. And think about it, that however many million that was, a six or seven million, whatever the heights of cost were, eight million, whatever, that was all going to come out of our thoroughbred industry economy. Correct. One way or the One other. One way or the Somebody other. had to pay that bill. Right. So that's a, that, that's, a, that's a huge thing, and it's a good thing because it's about horse welfare and safety, which is so important to us, right? Pretty exciting stuff, huh? It, it is. It is. Now, you and I have done this for a long time, okay? I mean, you and I have done this for about 11 and a half years um uh, together you have did it for decades before we ever knew each other i've done this for decades you've been with a firm that's known for its uh, ability to make things happen in tallahassee highly respected firm i did it mostly representing racetracks and <laughs> other various racing organizations in places like uh, washington oregon arizona california obviously here in florida most memorable times and done some federal lobbying as well and I think it's would be an understatement to say that you and I spent some real quality time this go round in Tallahassee. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you, as best as you can, and we know we can never cover the entire list. You've you've mentioned we both have mentioned Representative Stan McLean. His name deserves much mentioning. Could you could you talk about some of the other people that pay, sure. played a key role, elected sure. or not elected? And I know we're going to probably leave some out um, because there are so many. But go ahead and, and walk us through some of those big heroes. I like to call them heroes for our industry. Yeah, happy to happy to do that. You know, and if something as meaningful as this, it doesn't happen just because one or two people want it to happen. It happens because you've convinced a a large section or segment of the House, the Senate, the staff, the governor's office, you've convinced a lot of people to make it happen. And one or two people just can't do that. You know, right. we're, we're pretty good at patting ourselves on the back, but we had a lot of help. We did. And, uh, and so we, it's always good to recognize that help. So I would say if we start in the Senate, Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo is a, is a fan of the thoroughbred industry. She likes racing. She's been supportive of our industry for many years. She was an anti-decoupler before it was cool to be that. That's right. And, uh, and she was very helpful in getting this, this issue off the ground in the Senate. And without her, it wouldn't have happened over there. And Fan she, Fantastic and, leader. Yeah, she great really leader. Is. And she led, the, she led the charge for us over yes. there. And as well as the uh, Senate Finance and Tax Chair, Blaise Angolia, 
He did a great job as well. He's a very interesting gentleman. He's a professional poker player uh, and a developer, and uh, he's he's very fun to work with. And he has, you know, we always joke around about his hard face because you know he he doesn't know he never twitches, so you never really know what he's thinking. And he did a great job for us in committee talking about our issue and why it was necessary to be done. And he so, was fantastic. Yeah, he was good. Mm -hmm. And so we go to the house, and House Speaker Paul, Paul Renner is the one who signed off on the initial package. Uh, before anybody else had signed off, and that's what got us going. If, if this would be correct. If, if the speaker had not signed off, Representative McLean would have nowhere to go with what he wanted to do to help us. That's correct. I mean, he was a great advocate. He took our cause to the speaker, and the speaker had uh, had some experience with us. Had uh, he's, he's been to Ocala. He's seen the horse farms. He knows the industry, and he was supportive as well, and he, he said yes to the funding, and that that was very instrumental in getting us going. Also, Representative Lawrence McClure, who is a member of the agriculture community, was very helpful. He'll end up being the uh, the vice chair, I mean, the chairman of appropriations, most likely in a couple of years. And so he played a very key role, and hopefully he will play a role in continuing the support on down the road. But he was very instrumental in some of our first few uh, industry-wide meetings, which let me tell you what, those are not always much fun. That's right. And uh, we needed a little adult supervision at one point in the process, and he provided it. He did, and he, he, <laughs> did, he did it in a big way, and we were glad we were glad to have him involved. It yeah. was it And was then, of a course, there's a bunch of staff people whose names I'm not going to call out because right. they don't like that. Right. But we had a lot of technical, this is not, not as simple as it sounds. It was very complicated, and we had a lot of technical issues to hurdles to clear and they did a hell of a job putting all that stuff together and making sure it was written properly it was constitutional it passed muster and uh at the end we have a bill we can all be proud of you know and there's there's other teams involved too there's there's the team at smith Bryan and myers oh yeah i'd you know, be upset if i didn't mention yeah, that because so, uh, you, uh, you, you, john john reese at your side a good part of the deal and the, then the whole way the, then the whole firm from 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 jeffrey on down uh you have a great the great team there of support and then likewise i did uh oh no F question on, on team ftboa yeah and if i might lonnie i'll just say yeah. that you know i always i when i meet when i introduce my partners there's seven of us up there in tallahassee right. so when i introduce my partners to people I always say, you see a lot of me, I'm taking credit for all the work they're doing. And there's some truth to that. There's a lot of work behind the scenes, and it may be somewhat the same with you. And it I is, but let's keep it a secret so yeah. nobody knows. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will yeah. say no, this. It's very true. I will say this. You know, during, you know, in, in the nature of this process is you wait, you wait, you wait, yeah. and then you have, you know, 17 minutes to get an answer to somebody. Right. And then you wait, you wait, you wait, you have five minutes to get an answer to somebody. And the longer the process goes, as we get toward the end, the shorter those windows get. And we were always able to call you and your folks, and we were always to get great data, snap of the finger, which no one else in the industry could do. Right. We had it always, and I think that helped us be successful. So tip of the hat to you and your folks as well. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, we always try to, to be prepared and do our homework. And even at that, there's going to be some things that you had no idea were coming to the, the, the being in real time, right? Of course. And it was great having the folks in Ocala here to, to, to back us up. And then, of course, General Counsel Warren Husband behind the scenes. Uh, the so, wordsmith of all wordsmiths. Uh, I'm so relieved. Poor Warren. You know, I was told him patient and long-suffering Warren Husband because he's written, I don't know, you know, a hundred amendments for me during, over the years for you guys for the FTBOA and and we haven't gotten many of them into law and so you know at some point I'm thinking he's going to quit writing these things you know <laughs> <laughs> but but fortunately we were able to take Warren's good words and put them into law this time so that's right. maybe we get a reprieve for a couple and more years now <laughs> that's right so I, yeah I, I, there's so many people involved and of course uh, you were working with your peers the 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 chief lobbyists of the the the, the tracks. Um, during the process, and and uh, 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 Commissioner Simpson from AG was engaged. We had a it was a village. It was For a sure. village. And the For thing sure. that was nice about our package is it touched every part of our industry. Everybody was a winner yes. when this bill got passed. Which it was, wasn't just a breeder's win. It was a track win. It was a horseman win. It was a win for people that love our business or who appreciate the economic impact the green space would have. Yeah. Absolutely. And just one other thing I'd add about yeah. uh, former President Simpson of the Senate and, yes. and current agriculture commissioner. You'll remember we sat on a porch on a farm did, back right? in November, back I, in November, I remember and we and we laid out uh, our our problems to the ag commissioner, and he gave us some good good advice on how to pursue them. And I think that was the first step toward a toward a successful bill being passed. I would agree. I think that was a turning point for you and I um, getting some clarity 
And, you know, there's nothing like a seasoned veteran that's been there, done that. And, uh, and he's, he's an ag man and he gives good advice and counsel. So I do agree. Uh, we, we, we really kind of upped our game from that point. And forward. the thing that's interesting is he didn't quite lay it out. We no. had, he made sure we had to figure it out. No, they were, they were breadcrumbs <laughs> and we, we had to do the journey. That's correct. And that's, and that's, that's great. Cause I think quite honestly, as I look back, I, I know it didn't seem like it at times and same with you is really enjoyed the whole thing yeah. it was I've, I've done a lot of sessions this was an enjoyable one it was it was a lot of work but it was enjoyable it's much more fun when you win <laughs> it is you know and uh, and when you can bring revenue into an industry and it's not attached to a type of machine or it wasn't considered to be a, a welfare assignment or anything like that but in recognition of uh, your economic impact and your 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 presence and purpose in the state that's a great feeling and that should be shared by anybody that touches one of these thoroughbreds in florida because they're, they're all a part of that we're going to keep it going too yeah we're not done i mean to me this is just work part one it makes it more exciting to go after work yeah. part two right <laughs> yes it does so I, I i would think we'd keep working that but you know you bring up a good point because it never stops the uh, heavily regulated industry like our own uh, government and and politics and legislative oversight and all those things are always going to exist yeah and lonnie if i might i may yeah. have, i may have missed a couple of legislators as we're sitting here talking you know and i don't want to miss anybody yeah please so don't. i want to be sure to say thank you to senator dennis baxley oh, who yes. used to represent marion county and mm -hmm. still considers marion county very important he was very helpful and in the he's process. the pro tem in the, in the senate and mm -hmm. and was very influential and, and has then, always been a decoupler and of course senator keith perry right who now represents all of marion county yes and uh you know i don't want to leave those fellows out because they were very helpful when when it got down to the brass tacks at the end and so yeah. we ought to we'll make sure we want to make sure we don't forget anybody good point what's the best way that people in our industry can show their support of what economic development our industry uh, produces for the state for what we're trying to do that that either are involved in thoroughbred breeding or the thoroughbred business or are just fans of it or or believe it's very important that we exist how can those people show their support and be part of that political process on an ongoing basis that can best help us get our work done totally understand uh, you know we have a political action committee and we we uh, have been very involved in the in the process in the legislative process and as most industries are that are Florida based and that are interested in protecting and protecting their investment in, in, in the state uh, and we've been uh, I would say we've done well but there's always room for improvement there and if we can expand the base of contributors to our pack and get people a little more involved and a little more excited about it, I think we have good reason to now. Uh, I think that would be very helpful. We, we use those funds to bring legislators to Marion County to see horse farms in person. You know, we don't go to some fancy place out of state and have a big party. We bring them here. We bring them here and let them see what exactly what goes on down here. And we educate them about the industry. And we've been doing that on a consistent basis for many years, but we've been doing it with limited resources. And so I think if we could expand those resources, we could have a larger impact on the process. Thank you, Matt, for your wise words of experience and firsthand in the trenches knowledge. Working with you the past 11 and a half years through every conceivable legislative and policy gaming and paramutual challenge imaginable of which there were many such as the once never ending attempts to decouple with the ftboa at one time actually even being the only thoroughbred entity in florida to oppose decoupling and thanks to people like then senator president simpson senate president simpson pro tem uh, kathleen pasadomo and the ftboa even though we were solo at the time, thanks to those efforts, we were able to defeat that decoupling. Therefore, I think in some ways that still may be the biggest piece of legislation ever passed. And this is an important point to emphasize. If we would have been decoupled back in 21, we would not be here in 23 talking about legislation that was just passed during the session, uh, it just simply would not have happened. So in some ways, thank goodness that victory was there or we couldn't savor the nice revenue victory that we have today.
As, as we wrap up this show, please know that we will be offering future podcast episodes that will take exciting deeper dives into the significant economic possibilities and plans related specifically to Florida breads in terms of breeder and stallion awards, as well as purse incentives and supplements for Florida breads as a result of this exciting new legislation. These are great times and good times ahead for breeding, owning, and racing Florida breads in Florida. Again, I'd like to thank our special guest, FTBOA lobbyist Matt Bryan, for making this historic thoroughbred industry very good news podcast a reality. Well done. This podcast is presented by the Florida Thoroughbred Breeders and Owners Association and the Florida Department of Agriculture. 